Chelsea 4, Manchester United 3, perhaps the most entertaining game of the season so far, but probably for all of the wrong reasons. Let's get straight into those reasons. There is no time to waste today. What went on? What happened? Why was this such an open, chaotic game? Was it because of Chelsea? Was it because of Manchester United? The managers, the players. Let's break it down and let's start off with Manchester United in possession. Who were able to play the way out from the back using Onana as a third centre-back? United found it relatively easy to move the ball from these positions. Coupled with the fact that Chelsea didn't really press with great intensity, as we predicted, United were able to move the ball from the back, where they then got themselves towards the middle third of the pitch. Now, from this area, United often used what I would describe as a 2-3 shape, with the two fullbacks, Dallo and Wambasaka, tucking in a little bit, and then Casemiro, or Kobe Manu at times, or Bruno Fernandes at times, being this singular pivot. Of course, sometimes it'd be a double pivot, but the important thing for United was that we had players in close proximity, and we can see that we outnumber the Chelsea midfielders. Gallagher wants to stay high on Casemiro, Palmer on Dallo and Mudrick on Wan-Bissaka, but at the back here, Baran and Maguire outnumber Jackson. So when United were patient on the ball, we were able to outnumber Chelsea in these phases of the pitch and move the ball forward, and this was because we had players with close proximity to each other, nice and close to each other, reducing the distances, meaning you have that capability and certainly the potential to play quick two-touch passing football through Chelsea and I thought that United had done this really well at times. We can see this using Once Video Analyzer Pro by the way, great video analysis software, make sure to check it out, there will be a link in the description, I love using this because it really allows us to capture some of the good things and the bad things about the game. So we can see United here, we can see this sort of three shape across the middle of the park here, Dallo, whilst not being a fully inverted fullback, we can see he isn't hugging the touchline like a traditional fullback. And the same for Aaron wan down the bottom here as well. So this is United with that three in here. And like I said, it did allow us to create players with close proximity to each other. We can see all the passing angles in these sorts of areas of the pitch. The United players nice and close, which is a good thing. This was a real positive for United, I thought, in this game. What we've done on the ball at times I thought was pretty good. Further up the pitch, again, players close to each other. And when you do this, you create the potential to play quick passing football around the corner like we saw in this situation and it ends up leading to shots on goal in the final third of the pitch. So I thought this side of the United game was pretty good. I felt that United were playing well in these areas. The problem was we probably committed too many players to doing this. What I mean, basically, as we got the ball forward, you know, Rasmus Hoyland would be on the last line like so. We've got Kobe Menu up here, Bruno Fernandes, uh, Casemiro, Garnacho as well. The problem is we also got the fullbacks involved. Normally when you play inverted fullbacks, you tend to keep at least one of them deeper most of the time. But these guys were getting forward as well. Now once again, this was a good thing in a way because it gave United lots of options going forward. It allowed us to outnumber the middle of the pitch, play lots of passes in these areas and then quickly work the ball wide for one versus one situations with the likes of Anthony who actually played really well. Probably United's best player on the night. Really good. The problem is, when we lose the ball, look at the problems we face. Look at the shape we have to defend with when we lose possession. Yes, Dallo is in a position where he can still help, but he's the wrong side of play. It's the same for wan It's the same for Bruno Fernandes, for Kobe Mainu, for Anthony. They're all the wrong side of play when we do eventually overturn possession. And we know we are a side which, let's be honest, do overturn possession quite a lot. And when it happens, unfortunately... We just don't have the recovery capabilities in the midfield to really keep up. So Kobe Mainu is going to lose the ball on this occasion here. Quite high up the pitch, but keep an eye on Casemiro as this move goes on. Chelsea are going to counter-attack and we can see, first of all, initially, the lack of United players back. It's literally two centre-backs, Casemiro and Garnacho trying to do some work. But look at the mobility of Casemiro. Now, I don't want to just single him out here, but come on. Come on, that's not really okay. It's not really okay for a midfielder to be beaten that easily. And it was something which kept happening during the game. So I actually felt our attacking shape was decent. We got into good positions. I liked the close proximity of players. We saw some really good two-touch football. The problem was it came because we pushed so many players forward that when we then lost the ball, we have Casemiro, Varane and Maguire trying to defend the transition. And that's ultimately a recipe for disaster. Left loads of spaces. Chelsea attacked those spaces all night long. We all saw how many shots they ended up having, the XG they ended up having. That was a major, major problem for me with the Manchester United structure. The other problem I had with the United structure was in settled play in terms of when Chelsea were in possession. So what did that look like? So Chelsea were trying to play the ball from the back, of course, as you would expect. And a bit like Chelsea, United didn't really put that much pressure on the ball. We kind of 
expect that at times Hoyland would kind of press Bruno Fernandes as well, but we weren't fully committing to the press. We weren't fully committing to the press. The issue was that we were then man-to-man -man in midfield. And the problem with going man-to-man -man without putting a load of pressure on the ball is that it becomes very, very easy for the opposition to manipulate you. So before we continue into the video, a quick shout out to today's video sponsor, jerseyfifa.com, the home of all of the greatest football kits. Whether that be the new latest releases or the old classic ones like this, Jersey FIFA has something for everyone. And now you can check it out yourself using the link in the description down below. And also make sure to use code JERSEYFIFA for 10% off when you order. So as I said before the ad there, the problem was that Chelsea could manipulate our midfield too easily. Basically because United are man for man, when the Chelsea midfielders move, our midfielders move with them. So should Enzo Fernandes drop here, Fernandes will follow. If Caicedo moves wide, Kobe Mainu will follow. If Gallagher drops over here, Casemiro will follow. And obviously you can see the sort of space that that is going to open up in these areas of the pitch. Now you might think this is a slight exaggeration. But this spacing at times was actually there. It was present in the Manchester United midfield. And once again, we do have clips of this. If we go over to it real quick, let me just quickly get it up here. So we can see Chelsea are trying to play out from the back. And United, you know, we're not fully pressing. We have players in high positions, but the actual pressure on the ball is pretty minimal. The Chelsea player here has a lot of time to get his head up and play the ball from the back. So that's the first problem. But it's okay as long as the rest of the team is intense and in a good structure. But they're not. First of all, Kobe Mainu dragged out of position up here. I don't know if you can quite see it up here by Enzo Fernandez. So Enzo Fernandez moves to this right centre mid position. Kobe Mainu moves over. Now, immediately, we've got a rough idea of the sort of space which is being created in this area of the pitch. It's concerning. But at least we've got someone like Casemiro who's going to fill that space, right? Right? Well, not really, because again, he's also in a man to man system. So when Conor Gallagher peels to the left centre mid spot slightly, and Kobe Mainu's been dragged out wide here. Look at all this room in the midfield. With a lack of pressure on the ball, to then leave that room in midfield is criminal. Absolutely criminal. And it means that someone like Jackson can drop into these positions, for example. Varane's going to try and follow him. This is not Varane's game. It doesn't suit our centre-backs to play like this. The structure is just wrong. It's far too easy to pull our midfield apart and then go through it. It's far too easy. It's far too easy. And there's another situation here. So again, we are pressing reasonably high on this occasion, and at least this time there is pressure on the ball. But still, probably when it comes down to it, not quite enough pressure. So we've got Kobe Mainu on Enzo Fernandez here, it's not a bad thing. And we've got Casemiro keeping an eye on Conor Gallagher. Conor Gallagher all game long peeling left mid, left side of midfield to drag Casemiro out of position. And it works, because even though we actually forced Chelsea back initially, what we can see is as they go back, we then don't get pressure on the ball for Kukurea, but Kobe Mainu has been pulled out by Enzo Fernandez, Casemiro by Conor Gallagher. So this pass is going to go through the centre of the pitch. And we can see just how quickly you take out Casemiro up here still. We've got Kobe Mainu not even in shot. Bruno Fernandez up here. All our midfielders are gone. And again, Maguire, not the sort of centre-back who wants to be defending in these sorts of situations. But also, if you look behind him, the rest of the team is not there with him. So again, we've got that problem of the defence dropping off too much. They have to squeeze higher to support Maguire in this situation. But when they don't, Chelsea are quite comfortably able to turn out of these positions and move forward. So that was one of my key structural concerns last night. Just how easy it was to move through our midfield. Far too easy. And it's the same further up the pitch as well. This might sound like I'm coming across, you know, a bit harsh, but I really think tactically we were poor last night. Not necessarily all the same problems we've seen all season. They were slightly different ones because of how Chelsea approached the game. The problems nonetheless which we couldn't solve in the game we could not solve them so this next problem comes from the fact that manchester united are playing in what is essentially a 4-1-4-1 shape with Kobe menu and bruno fernandez ahead of casemiro and then obviously garnacho and anthony out wide chelsea are in a 4-2-3-1 shape so we've got enzo fernandez and caicedo a little bit deeper gallagher higher now what united want to do in this position once again as we've seen all season long is try to go man for man in midfield so if Caicedo was to get the ball and come out like this, it's Kobe Mainu's man. And the same for Enzo Fernandez here, up against Bruno Fernandez, it's man for man. Also, Casemiro against Gallagher. Now, initially, I've got concern with this plan because Gallagher is all about his energy, his engine, his ability to get out the pitch, uh, about the pitch, makes a lot of runs. Can Casemiro keep up with that? Not really. So if this had been a 1v1 battle, I would have been concerned with Casemiro. The problem, however, was that it became a 2 versus one battle. Because Cole Palmer would then move inside into this position to create this box shape in midfield. 
And we've got a problem because we want to keep pressure on the double pivot because we always do that. But now Casemiro's got two players to deal with. And, you know, obviously on occasion, Dallo was able to tuck in and help and deal with this. But it was made hard by the fact that Gusto was overlapping. Do you want Garnacho tracking all the way back into fullback? I feel like that was the indecision we had in the game. Garnacho doesn't know if he's meant to go all the way back. Dallo doesn't know if he's meant to fully follow Palmer. And I said this on the stream before the game. Moments of hesitancy in a defence is all it takes at this level of football, particularly for a player like Cole Palmer, Chelsea's best player by a mile. For him to be the spare man is really concerning. The fact that we left Cole Palmer free is a problem, and of course he, he played very well, but this was evident from so early on in the game. We'll take a look at this clip here. This is 50 seconds in. Let's go back there, sorry. This is 50 seconds into the game. We can see that Kobe Mainu was on Enzo Fernandez and is now making up ground. You know, he's, he's got ground to cover. And that Bruno Fernandez was on Caicedo. So you can see we were man for man in midfield. We've also, if I quickly grab the tool, we've also got Casemiro man for man with Gallagher. But the problem is, kobe has been caught high and now Palmer has this little bit of space that he can run into. And as he then comes inside, this was particularly before we really got to grips with what Chelsea were trying to do. Palmer is able to carry the ball into this area. And when we look at it, he's beaten Kobe Mainu already. Mainu doesn't have the recovery pace to deal with this. And we can see Casemiro is two versus one with Cole Palmer and Conor Gallagher. Again, I, I would have feared for Casemiro in a one versus one due to his physical limitations. But a two versus one, he's got no chance, the poor guy. Absolutely no chance. And that is how it felt for us from a defensive point of view. We had no chance. It was so easy for Chelsea to get into our box time and time again. No team in the Premier League has faced more shots in 2024. And it's because it is so easy to move through us. Ten Hag said after the game, but we've got the fourth least goals conceded in the league. There's nothing I can do about it. That's his quote, by the way, which is terrifying. But just, just because we're giving shots away, you know, it doesn't always mean that it's a bad thing. So, some people will say they're shots from distance, which we're giving away, for example. So it's, it's not so much of a problem. It's still a problem for me. Because of the sheer volume. If we're giving away 10 shots a game which are outside the box, I don't mind so much. When it's 20, pushing on 30, there's a problem. Because when you play against quality players, which you always do in the Premier League, there are going to be situations where they strike a ball really well and score wonder goals. Or they're going to get some lucky deflections. When you invite that many shots on your goal, you were just asking for it to go wrong. You are asking for it to go wrong. We saw it against Liverpool in the FA Cup. Liverpool scored a couple of decent goals, but they were deflected. People will say it's lucky, but we're asking for it to happen when we invite so many shots at our goal. You're asking Onana to be wrong-footed by a slight deflection, things like that. And of course, we saw it for the last goal, slightly different situation because it's a set piece. But you see the issue with giving away long shots. It's a problem, and it was a problem again all game long for Manchester United. All game long. I, I agree, I don't think Chelsea had that many clear-cut chances. I agree that I think the penalties were... You know, dubious. I feel like if they're not given on the pitch, then VAR probably doesn't overturn them. Particularly the second one. If you really look at it, there, there is a lack of contact. But you can't keep giving away this many chances. You, you just can't do it. Because a Cole Palmer will punish you, whether that's from the penalty spot or a lucky deflection. If you give these players time and lots of shots, lots of opportunities, they're going to score goals against you. And that's what Ten Hag has to realise. Yes, they might be difficult chances, but we're playing against difficult players. That's what Ten Hag needs to realise about this whole idea of it's okay to face so many shots. Simply put, it's not. It's not. And that's my concern with Ten Hag. I feel that on the ball last night, genuinely, I don't think we were too bad. I don't think we played too badly at all. I like the plan of trying to get us one versus one out wide. Garnacho, probably maybe not his best game, but was a threat all game long. And obviously two goals as well. Brilliant finishes. And Anthony, by an absolute mile, United's best player on the pitch. And without a doubt, his best performance in a Manchester United shirt. He was absolutely brilliant. I'm not just talking about the assist, which was incredible. His all-round game was brilliant. So, on the ball, I didn't mind what we were trying. I thought we, we looked okay. Again, that close proximity, the ability to move the ball through the pitch, creating the final third. I don't mind it. The problem was it comes at the expense of whatever that defensive shape is. And... It's a problem. It's perhaps just the same problem once again, which is what I've been saying all season. Is Ten Hag going to solve it? Would you guys like a video on how to solve it? 
Maybe that's a better question. If you want a video focusing on how United can try and solve some of these defensive problems, let me know in the comments. We have covered it before. I have done a few different videos. If you want another one, perhaps particularly looking at the fullbacks and how they were used at Ajax, let me know in the comments down below. Apart from that, we are finished for today though. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you have enjoyed it. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.